Hey, what's going on, my friend? It's Jeff Newbert from ChasingStrength.com. And in today's video, we are covering part three in the fitter but fatter phenomena. Okay. In today's video, we are going to actually quantify the answer to this question. How hard is too hard of a workout? Okay. But before we get there, recall that in part one, we discussed the best workout duration to avoid becoming fit, but fat. We'll leave a link in the video description below for, for part one and also part two, in which we briefly looked at the intensity threshold effect and what that means with respect to how hard is too hard. Now, if you recall, in the intensity threshold effect is the intensity, a percentage of your maximum effort that triggers a cortisol release. And recall, in most cases, many people with excess stomach fat, men and women, already have abnormally high circulating levels of cortisol, which are directly correlated with producing more stomach fat. So if that's you, you don't necessarily want your body to produce even more cortisol from your workouts because obviously that can produce even more stomach fat, contributing even further to the fitter but fatter phenomenon, right? That makes sense, doesn't it? So let's actually look at some of the specifics in the research, the scientific literature about the intensity threshold effect. So I think we'll end up leaving, we'll either put the research up here somewhere on the screen, or we'll leave it in the description below for you to go back and take a look at it. All right. So one study actually showed an increase in pre to post exercise cortisol from exercising at 30 minutes over the VO2 max, all right? By contrast, the same study showed that lower intensity exercise reduced circulating cortisol levels. So let's talk about contrast there. So we're talking about doing a hard aerobic workout over 80% of your max, or even a hard anaerobic workout, okay? So like interval training, as compared to something that's really easy, like taking a walk, okay? So the former increases cortisol levels, the latter decreases circulating cortisol levels, okay? Now, another study demonstrated that short 30-second rest between circuit training using 70 to 75% of a one repetition maximum for 30 minutes did not increase circulating cortisol levels during or post-exercise. So that's good news too. And in a seeming contradiction to the first study, another study, a third study, reports that high-intensity interval training, which is 85% or greater of the VO2 max, produced a 42% decrease in circulating cortisol levers, levers, levels after three weeks in a subcategory of obese individuals, okay? However, this same study also reports elevated circulating cortisol levels after regular bouts of endurance-based exercise, which gets us back to that 30-minute time frame we discussed in part one. And here is what the authors stated with regards to regular bouts of endurance-based exercise, okay? The stress responses to exercise may vary greatly depending on intensity, high, moderate, low, duration, short, moderate, long, and type of exercise, continuous versus intermittent, leading to different levels of allostasis, which may also be influenced by other parameters such as age, sex, and training status, all right? Now that explains the differences in individuals' responses to training programs. That explains why maybe a certain interval type training program using your kettlebells works great for you, but not for me and vice versa, okay? It has to do with that quote. So a fourth study, a strength and power training program reported decreased circulating cortisol levels as a result of that particular resistance training program, okay? Again, that was a strength and power focused strength training program, all right? Here's what the authors said. Another important finding of this study was that the amount of cortisol produced at resting levels was reduced and the response to the resistance stress was lower in the older men. So this is good news. This was, uh, you'll have to go look it up. I can't remember at the time of the filming of this video, but this was not young bucks, okay? I, this was definitely men over 40 and actually I believe it was men over 50. So that's great news. And let's take a look at one final piece of research. A 2021 literature review stated prolonged aerobic exercise, especially at higher intensities, significantly elevates cortisol concentrations when compared to similar duration and intensities of resistance exercise. Okay, interesting. Higher exercise intensities and duration appear to be the main contributing factors that influence the production of cortisol, increasing the potential for muscle catabolism and muscle loss. So it's interesting to note that this study pointed out something that we haven't discussed yet, but it's critically important to us, especially guys uh, over 40. All right. That's actually guys over 30, actually. I know I just said actually twice. I'm not actually sure why I said that actually. Wait, that's four times. All right. Never mind. Anyway, let's get back to the matter at hand. These studies also pointed 
to the increase or the potential of muscle loss from the catabolic effect from high duration and higher intensity prolonged endurance exercise. We'll get into that some other time, but certainly it is food for thought. And it's one of the big mistakes that guys over 40 make when they're trying to get back into shape or lose stomach fat is they focus on endurance exercise. And we don't want to do that. Okay. For obvious reasons that we just covered. So let's summarize what we've learned so far. Cortisol is one released at VO2 max above 80%, two not released from resistance training at 70 to 75% of a one repetition maximum performed with short 30 second rests in a circuit fashion. Cortisol is released after high intensity interval training and cortisol is decreased at rest by 42% after three weeks of specific types of HIT high intensity interval training in obese populations. And point number five, uh, cortisol is significantly decreased at rest after strength and power-based resistance training. So far, so good, right? But I think we still need to dig deeper on the too hard. So one of the things we haven't covered specifically is too hard also means too frequently. It is also important to note that since cortisol is a stress hormone and your workouts are perceived as a stressor, at least when engaging in HIT, okay, certain types of HIT, and that means training too often, at least using HIT can keep circulating cortisol levels elevated. Now, that may seem kind of strange, but let me give you a case in point, something that I experienced personally. So a couple of years ago, a private client of mine and I embarked on a daily swing challenge. You might have seen those things do X number of swings per day for X number of days. So what we decided to do is we were going to do hundred swings a day for six days a week. And we also decided we we're going to do hundred pushups a day for six days a week as well. So what we ended up doing is alternating sets of swings and pushups. And we did that for six weeks. Now that wasn't particularly hard for me per se, because I was just doing sets of 10 pushups and sets of 10. What, what are we talking about here? Swings, right? Sorry, lost my train of thought. It's a squirrel or something running by my window over there. A little shiny object syndrome here. So, and I, Generally speaking, got that done in around 30 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes every day. As I recall, when I go back and check my training journal, we did this for about six weeks before we decided to throw in the towel. Now, based on some other things that you might have read about swing challenges and those sorts of things, you know, you see videos like, here's what happened when I did 100 swings a day. All right, you might think that I got peeled, like shredded, jacked, whatever. Well, that was not the case. In fact, the exact opposite happened. I lost muscle and packed on stomach fat. You might be thinking, well, obviously you were super hungry, so you might have eaten a couple extra pizzas or, or milkshakes, or maybe you just didn't worry about your diet because, hey, you were working out so hard. No, that was not the case. And that was the case of the 100 swings and the 100 push-ups being a form of high-intensity interval training for me. And my diet didn't change at all. That was the one thing I kept constant. The only thing I manipulated was the actual training variables. So remember, as we saw from the research, HIT elevates your cortisol levels when performed too frequently. So you might be thinking, yeah, but Jeff, that won't happen with AGT. And for those of you who don't know what AGT is, it's anti-glycolytic training. It's a particular style, Soviet-inspired high-intensity interval training. Or if you follow the stop signs, or if you use auto-regulation, you know, I was doing those things during that six-week period, right? At the end of the day, your body only knows stress. Go back to that quote on allostasis, right? So too much stress for your body and your body cannot recover, which means it responds accordingly, like the fitter but fatter phenomenon. So, and that's because as we've seen, okay, let's just repeat this because it's it bears repeating. We got to pound this into our psyches because it's so contrary to what we have been conditioned to believe and expect about our training and from our training, okay? So remember, chronically elevated cortisol levels both increase stomach fat, visceral fat deposition and accumulation, and it increases muscle catabolism and destruction and muscle loss. Okay, so that is exactly what I experienced. Interestingly enough, this higher intensity, higher frequency, longer duration combination is one of the reasons that endurance athletes have a higher than normal circulating cortisol levels at rest. All right, we'll leave some research below. You can check that out for yourself. As I look back over the last 20 plus years of training others, the failures that I've experienced and that my clients have experienced is really due to the wrong combination of the following factors. The wrong combination of high aerobic cardiovascular exercise intensity, duration, so they've gone too long, frequency, they've done it too often, and effort, they've trained too hard, okay? Now, as a result, the body, their bodies, your body, my body won't recover. It doesn't recover as fast as it's supposed to. And this leads to chronically elevated circulating cortisol levels and the failure to get rid of visceral fat 
And in many, if not most cases, the accumulation of more stomach fat, even though by all other measures, you're getting fitter. So to wrap up, if you're currently experiencing the fitter but fatter phenomenon, it's because you are one, working out at too high an intensity, two, you're working out, can we just say training? I'm going to use both interchangeably. All right. So you're training too frequently and you're training too long or number four, any combination of the three above. So how do you fix it? right? It's great to point out all these problems, but if you don't offer a solution, you're just part of the problem, at least in my book. How do you get fitter or get stronger or in better shape without the accumulation of too hard, too frequently, right? And too much. And without the resulting accumulation of excess stomach fat. Well, here are some ideas for you based on what we've seen in this video, based on the research. Okay. So one train using 70 to 75% of your one repetition on your strength exercises or a corresponding repetition max two, three times a week. Two, limit your HIT, your high intensity interval training or your AGT style training work to two to three times a week. If your strength work is incredibly taxing, considering, excuse me, consider limiting it to one to two times a week. All right. Number three, engage in low intensity aerobic work like walking three plus days a week. Number four, add in active recovery and restoration work to reduce the stress on non-training days. And number five, consider combining number one and number two with protocols that make you stronger and elevate your heart rate. So in the description below, I will leave some resources for you with programs that fit the bill. Okay. I'll leave in a link to check out the ultimate kettlebell program, what I call the ultimate kettlebell program. I'll leave a link so you can check out a program that is basically minimalist at its finest. Okay. Or minimalism at its finest to say it a little differently. And I'll leave a link in the video below for novice and intermediate ultra minimalist programs for just improving your general conditioning and your health. And I'll even leave a link in the description below for advanced ultra minimalist programs for improving your conditioning. All right. So to wrap, if your goal is to solely lose weight and fat and you don't care about getting stronger, then one, use HIT or AGT three times a week. Two, engage in low intensity aerobic work like walking three or more days a week. And three, add in active recovery and restoration work to reduce your stress so you reduce the circulating cortisol levels on non-training days, okay? I'll also leave a program in the description below with, with a uh, link to that program that will help you do that. So hopefully that was a lot of information to take in. Hopefully you enjoyed these, this three-part series. Again, if you missed videos one and two, We'll leave the link in the description below. And if you have enjoyed it, go ahead and click the like button. Click the subscribe button if you haven't subscribed already. And if you know somebody, friend, family member, foe, uh, yeah, even foe, right? Be kind to your enemies. Bless them. Share this video or the first two videos with them and help them dig themselves out of the fitter but fatter phenomenon. Okay? Until next time, my friend, stay strong.